Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. What do Duke Ellington, B.B. King, Lena Horne, Ella Fitzgerald, and Little Richard have in common? They all stayed at the Hotel Metropolitan here in Paducah. With me today to talk about these performers as well as others is Betty Dobson, who almost single-handedly saved that wonderful old hotel from the wrecking ball. She won't say that, but I will. Welcome back. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Let's begin with the history of the Hotel Metropolitan. Of course, it goes back to Jim Crow segregation mm -hmm. days in Paducah mm -hmm. when African Americans could not stay at white hotels. Take it from there. Well, Maggie Steed came to Paducah in uh, 1898 and met a, a gentleman named Henry Steed. Uh, they courted for a while and 1906, she decided to marry him. They got married. Uh, Henry passed away shortly thereafter. Uh, but during that time, he and Maggie would take in um, people that were traveling, you know, people of color, and uh, because there weren't any hotels and they could stay in. So Maggie thought, well, man, you know, if I build a hotel for my folks, you know, they would they would flock to me, and, and Maggie was right. So she went to uh, Langford and Orr, which was the largest lumber company here in Paducah, and convinced them to build the, ho the Hotel Metropolitan. And not only that, Maggie was just really before her time, and she convinced the uh, designer or architect for Whitehaven to design the Hotel Metropolitan. Wow. So if you were to look at the columns at the at Whitehaven and the columns at the Hotel Metropolitan, they're very similar hmm. in design. Now the address of the hotel is? 724 Oscar Cross Avenue. And it is a, basically, it's a museum. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually go in and I've toured it, enjoyed it very much. Mm -hmm. And throughout the, 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 the museum, you have displays and the explanations of the hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the, uh, many years ago, it was, it was falling down and was probably going to be torn down. So what did you do to get that hotel saved? Well, uh, Cheryl Cooper and myself, along with, there were many others. You know, I don't want to kind of go into the names in case I leave someone out, but I feel like I, I would be remiss not to mention Sharon Poe, Mary Hammonds, Bill Black Jr., uh, Rosa Scott, all those folks uh, came forward and said, you know, this is a great project, let's do something to save it. And uh, it's, it's in my neighborhood. So I saw this, you know, huge building that was falling down and uh, Cheryl and I had already set up a little building to accommodate kids for candy and things like that. But then the history started rolling towards us, telling us who were, who were some of the people who stayed there. And, um, you know, it was just unbelievable to think Cab Calloway was in the very area, you know, that we were, or mm -hmm. uh, Ike and Tina Turner, mm -hmm. um, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Butterbean and Susie, uh, Mom Mabley. You know. I remember her. Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was a comedian. Yes, yeah, yeah. raunchy comedian. Yes, she was. <laughs> that was a, yeah, that was an that <laughs> was not in adult. comparison no, to today. No, but at but the time, uh, that was definitely adult oh, comedy. Yes, she yes. was. She was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what did you do to to physically restore the old hotel? You, you got the group together. Everybody's ready to go. Get the job done. So then, how was the job then actually done? Well. Um, we were fortunate enough to meet Bill Black Jr., who is a, was at that time a contractor and still a preservationist. And uh, he came aboard to let us know what we needed to do in order to save the hotel. And gave us a figure of, oh, if you got $250,000 you know, raised, which almost knocked us off our oh, feet, you sure, know, sure. well, that you, we could probably save the hotel. So, uh, Coach Gaines, I know you know Clarence who he Gaines, is. Big Clarence House Gaines, Big House, course, yeah. Right. Uh, donated the hotel to us. And, and his mother owned it? His mother owned it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was um, 
Lester Gangs and Olivia. Olivia, I remember uh -huh. Olivia. Uh, uh -huh. That ran the hotel and uh, she ran it until she passed away and then it fell into Miss Strickland, her sister's hands. Uh -huh. And then it came back to Coach Gangs and he donated it to the Uppertown Heritage Foundation. Uh -huh. And uh, then he introduced us to, um, oh my goodness, I'm looking right at his face. Um, a gentleman who worked with rural development suggested that we put in an application. We did, uh, John Duncan was his, his name. Uh, we qualified for a loan. Uh, in fact, uh, John Duncan came down to look at the project to make sure it was something worth you know, saving. And he was so impressed because he grew up uh, in a similar time and could uh, remember times when folks like uh, the big name uh, folks would come in town and would stay in a little hotel in the, his community that had been torn down. Mm -hmm. And so he was saying, this is a great project to save. Um, and so when they went in, and I don't know if you remember, Barry, but remember how it had that sway back on the roof? And oh, yeah. Every, and yeah. you know, it, everybody referred to it as an old mare, looked like an old uh, mule or whatever. Right. Well, you know, we were, I was, I have to say, I was kind of petrified about going into the hotel because I could see that. And, um, you know, we called all these other agencies like the, um, uh, Kentucky um, African American and Native American agency, and they sent some folks down to help us. And they were like, "Have you been inside yet?" And I'm like, "No," because you know <laughs> that you know I, I, I'm on a cane anyway, and I'm thinking, you know, I don't want to go in and fall through the floor. And and it was the night before uh, uh, Ray uh, Ray Black Jr. and and some of his colleagues had gotten together a city meeting. And then it was Mayor Jones, who was uh, the mayor at Albert that time. Jones, uh -huh. right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, this day was so, was a, an important day, but it was like all this confusion going on. And while we were getting ready for this meeting, we were sending out pet petitions to get help. So when we go to uh, Mayor Jones, we would have something saying the community backs us on it. Well. Again, the folks came down from Frank Frankfurt and they was like, you have to go in this building so you know what you're gonna fight for. And I was like, okay. We opened the door and as soon as we opened that door, it was like somebody throwing on a light switch for me. That it was like, you could, you know, you could see Ella coming down the stairs uh, you could you could see BB you know maybe sitting over in a corner. Uh, it just had that feel of history and uh, elegance, and you know we knew we had to save it. And so when we left from that that from the hotel at that time, we were all fired up. You know it just brought a a, a real sense of cause what, why we were doing this and why we needed to raise the money, ask for the time. And uh, we got there at the meeting and the place was packed. <laughs> it was just really intimidating to see all these people and they were there to save trees and some of the sidewalks. And, and then when the hotel came up, it was just this overwhelming roar, you know, of people going, yeah, save the hotel, save the hotel. And, and what was the clincher was Oscar Cross came. Mm -hmm. And I know you remember oh, Mr. Sure, Cross. Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Cross said, we need to save that hotel. And I want you to stand up, stand up. And the room just came to a roar, you know. And so after all of that, uh, Mayor uh, Jones said, what can I say? <laughs> what, you know, we'll give you some time to uh, raise funds. And as I said, John Duncan had already put us some money in place and Senator Leeper and Representative Rash had done what they could do for us. And, you know, everybody came into play. Remember you did the uh, Upper Town brochure for us right. and, you right. know, put us kind of on the map so people would have a reason to come into the area to help us tell the story. And um, 
after all of that, and we got the 300000 and they started working on the hotel, they was going to go, uh, y'all going to need about 500000 more. Yeah, it was like, that's oh. That's often the case. That's often the case. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, it was like then, you know, after uh, raising it up and repairing the uh, the, the the foundation mm -hmm. and the uh, the You can roof. just never tell about old buildings that you really can't. No, the plaster then began to fall off the walls, you know, and it was like, oh my gosh, what else? And if we were going to have, our original plan was to make it a and b so you had to put in things that would accommodate a b and b mm -hmm. and, you know, to think we had to raise, you know, another $500,000 was unthinkable. I mean, we were a bunch of, uh, uh, of ladies who had a good cause, we thought, but we knew nothing about fundraising, getting mm -hmm. monies together. But the hotel was really blessed that way. People loved it, just not in our community, but, you know, throughout the state, throughout the nation. Um, there was a gentleman who, what was that? Um, it was America, I, I can't recall his show, mm -hmm. but he came to Paducah, did a little segment, um, but he said, I, I found, heard a little something about the hotel, and he said, I couldn't do the story on Paducah without doing a story on mm -hmm. the hotel. So mm -hmm. we just kept on going, and this gentleman called and said, well, maybe we can help you get some money. And he was with the Heritage Council, mm -hmm. and uh, we were able to get $250,000 more. The county was like, okay, now how are we going to get that money? We can't just get it on our own. And, you know, there were a lot of good projects going on in the county, city, that could have used money as well. And, you know, how do you ask for that? And But, you know, as I said, it seems like we were just so blessed. and. The county did what they needed to do to help us. The city did what they sure. needed to do to help us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were able to raise money. And plus, I have I would be remiss in not saying this, the um, unions came out to help us. Mm -hmm. You know, the plumbers and pipe fitters, mm -hmm. the, the carpenters, you, you mm -hmm. know, you name it, they all had mm -hmm. the electrician, the brotherhood. Mm -hmm. um, they all came out to make sure, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, that the hotel. They also, of course, got the, the building trades got involved in saving Brook Stadium, too. So that, mm -hmm. they have a real history, there. and that's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it finally opened. It was all done. What year? In 2008, where there was no more like, okay, it's safe for you guys to come yeah. in. <laughs> you don't have to step <laughs> over that hole, or right, you right, know, right, right, yeah. right, right. Well, having done the background, these are incredible stories about various guests. Uh, let's just start with Duke Ellington. What are, what's the story of Duke Ellington in the hotel? Well, uh, Reverend Jimmy Hodge Remember. was a great resource for Absolutely. us, and yeah. along with Valma Hammock and others that was in They're the They're deceased, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember both of them, of course, yeah. But... Um, uh, Reverend Hodge had told us, uh, we asked who had stayed there, and he rolled off, that was one of the first names he had rolled off was Cab Calloway, and that he stayed there, and, and uh, where he played, there was a uh, building that was uh, uh, a, it was about on 10th Street, I guess, in mm -hmm. 10th and Kentucky or somewhere along there. Mm -hmm. uh, when I interviewed people, some people would tell me that it was a skating rink, and others would say, no, it was a tobacco barn. So I was like, okay, it could be two different places, but he would come and he would play. I think they were, you know, the places were one and the same, but he would play there, and they sit also at the Ritz. Um, but that came from another source, but mm -hmm. I know for sure. Cab Calloway or Duke Ellington or both? Both. Both I'm of sorry. Right, right, I, I, right. I talk about one and I'll yeah, get going on both, the yeah, other. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, Duke Ellington. Um, did, did people say what they were like personally? They're, they're famous entertainers. Did, did people talk about what they were like? I mean, what was Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway like just as a 
person? Uh, well, Cab Calloway, I, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to meet his grandson, C. Calloway Brooks, and uh, a few years back. In fact, I met him through uh, West Kentucky uh, Community and Technical College. He did a show here. But at any rate, he uh, was sharing with me that his grandfather was, uh, he didn't take a lot of stuff and that he was sure that he stayed at the hotel. You know, he didn't, he was younger, so he d had no mm -hmm. idea, mm -hmm. but was sure he stayed at the hotel. But he shared stories that his uh, grandfather had such horrible um, encounters with racism oh, sure. that he, uh, eventually brought his own, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, with a train. He, you know, he had a, something to accommodate his people that were on, was on the railway. Right, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he wouldn't have to uh, worry about if there was a place for him to right. stay he or his uh, yeah. band or whatever. Baggage with him, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, most gosh. You, Ella Fitzgerald. Oh my God! You said coming down the step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if I had to say, if I could tell you what a person was like, I could. I guess I could uh, comment on her. I asked Coach Gaines. I said, of out of all the people you've named off that stayed here, who was the one that you know affected you the most? And he said it was Ella Fitzgerald. He said she was absolutely beautiful coming down those stairs of the hotel. And he said that he was lost for words to even say anything. And, <laughs> and if you knew Coach Gaines, yeah. you know that was quite an accom it would accomplishment. Right, right, right. But he said that she was so nice and she picked at him. And uh, another story I, I got about uh, Mrs. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald was from uh, I think his name was Joe Dance, Mr. Dance. Um, again, gentleman had passed away, but he, it was it was really cute how people would come up and want to share stories about what they knew. But he was sharing with me that he walked up, he was kind of feeling pretty good, and it was that he he used the term roller uh, roller uh, skate place, mm -hmm. uh, roller rink, mm -hmm. and anyway, he said that. Uh, he had had a couple of drinks and he was feeling pretty good. And <laughs> he saw Ella standing there and he said she was looking really good. And he was talking about the gentleman that she was playing with. And But she toured with him, um, but he, he made fun of him, saying he was a little short, midget-like guy, <laughs> looking over the drums, looking at him, you know. And, and he toured with Ella. In fact, he put Ella on the, the map. Um, she did the song Atistic, Atastic. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, he said that he was looking over the drums at him and he walked up to uh, Ella Fitzgerald and said, my name is Tommy Dance, would you like to dance? <laughs> and uh, said she looked at him and said, I, I don't, and said they both started laughing and he said she was just a really nice person. I, I, I don't recall him saying if he actually got a dance. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> but, you know. That's great. Well, one of the stories I remember uh, is Gladman Hummels talked about when B.B. King would come here that he would place an order in advance for sweet potato pies made by mm -hmm. Robert Coleman's mother and he would come to the hotel and uh, would actually sit on the porch and play music and the kids would gather and people would gather and just have this terrific free concert. Mm -hmm. Any stories about B.B. About, about King that you remember? Yes, uh, again, uh, Reverend, well, Reverend Hodge, again, was our great source, and he would tell us how he would sit on the porch and, and, and play uh, music, and uh, the community would just, you know, be out there listening, and you know, he just described it so vivid that you could almost imagine or see the folks out there and him with Lucille plucking on it. And, and you know, when we all think of B.B. King, we think of this older gentleman that you see today. Right. But B.B. was a good looking man in his, <laughs> <laughs> his younger days. And in fact, uh, when he was here, we tried to make contact with him and uh, we made contact with his uh, office and asked about if he, what he remembered about the hotel, and he said he didn't remember the hotel. 
And I was just absolutely heartbroken. I thought, how could he not remember the hotel? Well, others had told me, well, for one thing, it, it wasn't always called the Hotel Metropolitan. It was mm. called, some people called it the Metro. It was called the Metropolitan House. You know, it had other right. names right. that we didn't realize right. throughout the year. And another thing they told me, they said a lot of times, B.B.'s clothes stayed at the hotel, but B.B. didn't because he was a young man and, <laughs> oh. you know, the ladies <laughs> would, you know, uh, yeah, he didn't yeah. have to stay right, at the hotel right, a lot right. of times, but he would drop his things off <laughs> right. if he was going to uh, stay I, at the I hotel. I totally understand that. That's <laughs> terrific. Uh, well, let's who else uh, on our list here. Um, gosh, this goes way back. Uh, uh, King Oliver and Jelly Roll Morton. Those are, that's way back. What did you way know about back. them? Well, again, uh, we heard stories about Fats Waller coming through. Right. And that he was, you know, one of the greatest piano players. And, oh, sure. and I think he did movies, if, or not movies, as they were commented to be today. They were just referred to as films. And um, uh, Oscar Cross and uh, Reverend Hodge would tell us uh, about you know, the kind of entertainer he was and uh, that type of thing. And the other person that you mentioned oh, was... Oh, uh, General Morton? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, only one I can remember, I, I don't have a story about him, but I just know that he had stayed... Uh, and, of course, King mm -hmm. Oliver, that's way mm -hmm. back. That, that's yeah. early, early on. Now, uh, King Oliver, uh, what we did find out or know is that he... Uh, had uh, Louis Armstrong to p play with him for a number of years, and Louis Armstrong was discovered by Fate Marable. Of course, who was from a, Paducah. Uh -huh. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. That, that when he's in New Orleans on his uh, the band. Well, mm -hmm. now we, we were talking earlier, wondering if if maybe Fate Marable encouraged these other musicians. If you're, if you're coming through, say you're going from St. Louis to Nashville or back, vice versa, Paducah's a good place to stop. Mm -hmm. You suppose mm -hmm. maybe he did that? Uh, yeah. If I was a betting person, I would I would bet on that because his family owned, had interest in the Hotel Metropolitan. Mm -hmm. Mamie Geish was a member of uh, Fate Marable's family, so I, I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, he would say, stop by the hotel. Another reason I feel that he it was supported not just by Fate, and other musicians is that Paducah was a part of the Chitlin Circuit. And the Chitlin Circuit was like your underground railroad for um, travel if you mm -hmm. were of color. And you know, when uh, some folks hear Chitlin Circuit, they think that it was just for uh, musicians of uh, that type of thing, but it, it wasn't, it was just, um, it was to let you know that you were on a good, safe route. You know, you and your family can travel from X, Y, Z to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, through the South. And if, it, you know, and it wouldn't just be uh, taverns or bars, it would be restaurants, hotels, if there were um, homes of people who were willing, mm -hmm. or, or people who were willing to open their home to let you stay through the night. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I'm pretty sure that uh, fate, you know, told people to stop by and, you know, it grew uh, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. you, you know, were traveling, you wanted to stop at the hotel. Louis Armstrong, of course, w was there. Mm -hmm. Any stories about him? Oh, yes. Uh, this one came from Miss Hammock, uh, Valma Hammock, mm -hmm. who owned Hammock's funeral. Sure did. Mm -hmm. And she shared with us that uh, Louis Armstrong came to town with his band, and he always pursued her. He wanted her to become a singer, but really? she uh, was caring for her family. Uh, her husband was, el you know, ill, and uh, she had elder parents that she cared for. So it was, you know, and she was a gospel singer. And uh, that was just not something that she could see herself doing. But when he would come to town, he would always stop by and visit her. And, um, and he was just really pumped about a performance that they would have downtown at the 
Ritz Hotel. And uh, uh, she told us that they went out and they were just excited. And then when they came back, everybody was just, just really low. And um, she shared how they were not uh, uh, able to enter the front of the building. They had to enter through the rear of the building. And if they w needed to use the restroom, they were given coffee cans, Maxwell House <laughs> coffee cans, to use uh, upstairs on the uh, roof. They were not even um, able to use them uh, wow. outside. They had to go to the roof uh, to use the bathroom. And uh, she said they came back and they were just so down and um, then she said a few minutes later somebody would play something on the piano and she said, honey, we just moved on. You couldn't dwell on them things. You moved on, you moved on. Yeah. But, it, you know, it was just great to hear that, you know, Louis Armstrong right. stayed at our little hotel. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Well, when he would, would they do just impromptu jam sessions, just the musicians oh, yes. would just start playing uh -huh, just for fun? Uh -huh. Yeah. In fact, they said that's why the Purple Room, uh, we have a little block building at the back of our hotel. And, uh, I, you know, I had heard rumors, people talking about the Purple Room. What are you going to do with the Purple Room? Well, upstairs there was this hideous purple color <laughs> room. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of thought, well, this is the Purple Room. But I thought, how could they play in here? And uh, not knowing that people were really referring to the block buildings out back and so one in particular and so we went out back and there it is this purple paint that's in this back room or, or building that had a concrete floor and a beautiful um, handmade bar that's in it you know wow. and so uh, there, there was dice and <laughs> sure. little, you know, so All the we fun knew, stuff. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, so yeah. we knew that was like a meeting place. But the community also shared with us that that was a place you might would hold your um, uh, team party or uh, if there was some kind of social event, a prom or something like that, a get together, you might would use the purple room as your. Mm -hmm. um, place to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a one, that, that, those are wonderful stories. <laughs> uh, I'll just also, let's see, Ray Charles mm -hmm. stayed there. What, stories about Ray Charles? Yes, now Ray, my stories of Ray Charles, uh, people in the community had said, you know, Ray Charles stayed there, but nobody could say what year or anything like that. So my mother always had a friend, ain't I ring, who would say she knew, uh, her brother, uh, Duke Wade, uh, hung with Ray Charles and all these big name people, Sarah Brown, uh, you know, just all these big name people. And I was like, okay. So I called him one day and he said, uh, I said, do you know if Ray Charles stayed at the Hotel Metropolitan? He said, yes, I know that. I said, well, how do you know? He said, because I booked him. He said I was his uh, road manager. And so it was my job to make sure that the band had somewhere to stay while they were on the road. So I would book them at the Hotel Metropolitan. He said, I stayed with family, because <laughs> that's the way you yeah, did. Sure. You know, if you had family in, right, in town, you of wanted course. to stay with your family. Right. And, uh, you know, these other folks would be where they could. Now, I, ha I, I feel like I have to say, uh, if you did not, have someone to stay with or if there wasn't a hotel back in those days you would think what was available to you and um, folks shared with me that you would go to a funeral home or, or the nearest black church to see if they would open their doors to let you stay through the night if there wasn't somebody that was willing to take you in mm -hmm. but um, you know, I thought that was kind of interesting. But Duke shared that uh, he he had uh, put him there. And I, I wow. have, have to share with you a, a story about one of the pictures <laughs> of Ray Charles that we had upstairs. Uh, when we went through our renovations and, and we were putting up our posters uh, of different people near the 
end of the hotel upstairs, we put Ray Charles's uh, picture. Well, we would come back the next day and it would be on the floor. I mean, you know, every, every time we would leave, folks would go like this, bam, because it had the uh, Delcro on the back. So we Delcroed it to the wall and we'd come back and it'd be on the floor. So they said, maybe somebody doesn't want <laughs> Ray Charles here. We changed out Ray Charles, put Thurgood Marshall, and put uh, Ray Charles where Thurgood Marshall was at, and he's been there ever since. He's not been on the floor anymore. So. Wow, that's an interesting story. Of course, Thurgood Marshall, Supreme Court Justice. Mm -hmm. Now, how did he come to stay there, do, do we know? Well, I had one story, um, which I kind of found out was a little different than it, than it was delivered to me. But he came to represent uh, someone who was uh, a black man who was accused of killing a uh, white gentleman uh, over a woman. And they said that was one of the first times he came here. And then he came to get our Vice President Barkley uh, fair in order uh, when he passed away. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know that. Wow, that's that's amazing. They said that was probably the last time. And uh, someone else shared with me that he was uh, watching the integration of Tillman really closely as well. Hmm. That Tillman was a, uh, hmm, I guess a trial uh, school. Hmm. In, within mm -hmm. the state that they mm -hmm. were, you mm -hmm. know, just watching how the, mm -hmm. you know, integration was. Interesting, mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, well, let's see who else. Mahalia Jackson. Mm. Oh, well, Mahalia Jackson uh, came here in 1946, I believe, if that's right. I believe that's right. Jimmy Hodge told me about him and also, or about her, and also, um, Miss Jones, I, I hope that's her correct name. She's the mother of Dr. Stephen Jones. And she shared with us At Murray State? Uh -huh. oh, I know Steve, he mm -hmm. lives in Mayfield. Well, yes. he lived in Paducah for, uh, when, you know, he was younger. Right. And his mom dated the pr uh, promoter who brought a lot of these big names in. Wow, mm -hmm. okay. His name was Richard Bell, and Mr. Bell brought in a lot of these big name okay. performers right. here in Paducah. Right. And she shared with me that, uh, well, th this is kind of the same story from both of them, but in, in different perspectives, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Reverend Hodge told me that it was uh, how she arrived in Paducah at the hotel. He said she was driving a Buick and a and it had a trailer on the back of it and it had her piano in the trailer. That said right? that she just didn't trust anybody with her piano and he, you know I thought that was kind of oh that's funny. wonderful and. Uh, she played at the Lincoln School. That's right. where she was performing. And uh, Mrs. Jones uh, was sharing with me that that day uh, there was a line of white people going in as well as, as lines of black people. And she said that Mahalia's voice was so powerful that when she was singing that it brought the people together. That, you know, it didn't, the lines didn't matter anymore. It was just that her voice was so strong and it just came, she used the word barreling out of the school that it brought everybody wow. together. Wow. So I, I love that. That's it's one of my favorites. That's a great story. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Billie Holiday. Well, I shouldn't have said that was one of my favorite because this might be my favorite story. Well, go right ahead. <laughs> They're all excellent stories. They're all thank good you, stories. Thank you, thank you. Oscar Cross uh, shared with me and Cheryl Cooper, as, as we were trying to find out history we could put in the hotel, he said, uh, well, you know, he was sharing all these great people who had been there, like Fate Marable. People were saying Fate had a uh, Paducah connection, but when you would go look him up, it said New Orleans, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and so. I think he died in St. Louis, too, I believe. Right, mm -hmm. but he's buried here. Oh, right, he is, mm -hmm. at Oak Grove, he certainly mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but, you know, we was like, it, was he really from Paducah? 
And so Mr. Cross said, yeah, his mom lived right around the corner in front of the, uh, the uh, W.C. Young Center. Said, don't believe that crap. I don't know where they got that at, but that's where he's from. I said, oh, okay, well, that's good to know. And he went on, you know, to share how he himself wanted to be an entertainer. He was a dancer by uh, choice. He loved to dance, mm -hmm. but his wife said, no, we can't, you can't do that. And they were caring for his elderly mother right. and said, well, we just can't do mm -hmm. that. But everybody in the community knew that, uh, you know, Mr. Cross, was a uh, excellent dancer, and so uh, I'm sure his daughter was here at her school for years. Gail Ridgeway, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I told Gail, I said, you never told us these stories. She was like, well, you hear them all the time. You know, you don't think they're, you know, they're mm -hmm. stories. It's, mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate, he he was talking about he had this young girl that came to him, and she was about eight years old. Said her aunt or grandmother brought her. And uh, he worked with her, showed her how to dance and how to sing songs, you know, stage presence and all of that. And uh, said when she became 12, uh, her mom came and got her and took her away. Well, he said, do you know who that girl is? I said, no, I don't. He said, that three, you know, three of them, three girls, they sing. They broke up now, but there was three of them. Well, you know, the Supremes immediately came to my mind. So I said, uh, the Supremes? And he said, no, one of them. I said, Diana Ross? And he was like, no, but she played her. She played that girl, this girl. Her name is Dory. And I said, Dory? And he said, yeah, but they call her uh, Billie Holiday. I was like, get out of here. Wow. And he, I said, Donna Ross did play Billy Holiday. Absolutely. And he Absolutely. said, that's who I'm talking about, Billy Holiday. Said she was here when she was about eight years old. I worked with her. Uh, her mom came and got her. And he said, some me and one of his friends, and uh, you have to forgive me because I can't remember if it was Chicago or St. Louis that he was at, but it was at, you know, one of the metropolitan cities. And uh, uh, he saw this this poster and he said it looked like Dory. So he said he went in there and to the club and he said, uh, I want to see this woman. And he said, would you go get her for me? And said the, the guy went and got her and said she came up and said, I didn't say nothing, I just stood there. He said she looked at me and said, is that you, Oscar Cross? <laughs> and he said that was Billy Holiday. And he, wow. was, he had his chest oh, on. Oh, I guess you know? so. Well, I guess he would. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a wonderful story. Yeah, Billy Holiday. Wow, wow. And lived in Paducah. That is an amazing, I never heard that before. Mm -hmm. That's a tremendous story. Wow. Well, that's going to be hard to top that one, but uh, we can try here. Uh, okay. uh, Sam and Dave? Well, don't have much story okay. you know, about him. them. I do know that Duke uh, Wade put him there at the, at the hotel. Okay. He was the one who put okay. him there. James Brown. Yep, he uh, booked him. Okay, uh, Sam Cook booked him, but he he would always say that it was a trouble, a problem with Sam Cook anywhere they went. The women, you know, oh. he, he said that <laughs> that that out of you know all you know, it, there's always you know people who are after celebrities, but he said Sam Cook was the worst one because people, the women, were always, always after him, so. I never had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't know about that. Uh, <laughs> Muddy Waters. Well, again, I, I really don't have much of a story. I just know that he was one of the celebrities that, uh, uh, that was, told to me over and over mm -hmm. that had been to Paducah and stayed at the hotel. Mm -hmm. Sarah Vaughn? Same way. Mm -hmm. And Little Richard? I do have a story about oh, Little good. Richard. Uh, there was a gentleman uh, in Mayfield, but at any rate, he, he and his wife uh, called me up and I was, I, that's when I worked at Courtesy and he said, I've got a story for you. I said, okay, and he began to tell me that his dad owned the funeral home in uh, Mayfield, and they owned a service station as well. And uh, this gentleman came by 
white man. He told him, said, look, uh, there's a fancy looking colored guy <laughs> Uh, broke down on the road, you might want to go see about him. So they said they dropped it, jumped in their little truck, go out there to see what was going on, and it was little Richard. Said his dad, said, you stay out here, work on the car, and I'll be right back. So he came back with the hearse, you know, the limo. <laughs> Picked him up and drove him through uh, Mayfield. And so his wife was laughing on the phone, you know, I could hear her in the background. So I asked, uh, what, what, are, what are you laughing about? What's, what do you remember about that? And she said, oh, honey, we, the women, all oh, us girls ran after his car. And she said, you know, the funny thing, he had no interest in any of us. <laughs> None of us had a chance. And she wow. Thought, but it was so funny but how uh, that he was able to uh, run home, well, his dad, while he was taking care of the car and the dad yeah. would come back with the, the limo to, you know, Oh, that's a terrific story, a terrific story. To show him off. Absolutely. Um, I think that's pretty much all the list. I, anybody that, that we left out that you can recall off of the list? Well, maybe not in a music sense. Well, any, anyone, um, yeah. But um, Marcus Haynes, we had him here uh, in 2002, and uh, he showed, told us about the... Uh, there was like this little board uh, that was right in the front at the entranceway of the hotel. And uh, it was still up when he was there because the hotel was still kind of rough. And he said, oh my gosh, whatever you do, don't let anything happen to this board. He said, because you know who, who had this board? He was rubbing on it. And I said, no, he said, Jesse Owens. He said that he came there with them. Uh, he was a traction that traveled with the Harlem Globetrotters. Of course. And at, uh, he signed in on the board. And uh, he told us that uh, he would uh, go upstairs, all the guys, you know, being young, said sometimes they had to sleep with two or three guys in a bed or mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. because they didn't have room nor the money. And he said, you know, I would turn out that light, Betty, and be in the bed before it was dark. And I was like, okay. Right. <laughs> yes, yes. But, you know, he shared with us, and, and uh, Satchel Paige stayed at the hotel. Is that mm -hmm. right? I had a, um, I, today, I don't know who this, this man is, but I was at the gas station, and he came up to me, and he said, I want you to know I played with Satchel Paige, and he stayed at that wow. hotel. Wow. He said I could have left with him. He said, but I had a family, right. and I couldn't go. Yeah. A lot of ball players, a lot of musicians like that. Mm -hmm. Well, Oscar Cross, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And Paducah had a celebrity that um, was kind of not, I guess, really not given the, the kind of credit that he deserves. His name was R.Q. Dickerson, uh, um, musician, mm -hmm. um, played all kinds of music, and I, I want to say that he was uh, traveled with Cab, but it might have been Duke Ellington that he traveled with. And in fact, he decided not to come back to Paducah or back to this area. He went on to stay in Europe and uh, came back, I think maybe in the 60s, he came back to the United States, um, hmm. you know, because it was a little bit easier place to live, you know. Oh yeah, I mean, with segregation, mm -hmm. absolutely. There was a man from uh, from Clinton, and I can't remember his name, but I wrote a story about him years ago with a newspaper. Uh, this guy was in service in World War II, and and uh, he was amazed at how the the, the color barrier w was non-existent in France. And he stayed in France after the war and started a barbecue restaurant in Paris. And I saw this on an, an NBC television program, one of the news shows, and, and he mentioned Clinton, Kentucky, and I thought, wow, well, I was able to, uh, to track down this man's relatives, went to Clinton, and had quite a bit on him, but it was the same thing. He said that it was segregation, it was discrimination, it was Jim Crow, and he was happier there. And I phoned him up got him on the phone, he talked about it, and, and all the dishes he served were named for various relatives he had back in Clinton, so uh -huh. uh, that happened. And he was, uh, th in this restaurant, it's closed. Oh, well, we were in Paris a few years later, and I went looking for it, but he had died and it had closed. But Bridget Bardot stayed there, and what was interesting was, 
when he opened it, they had, didn't know what barbecue was in Paris, had never seen it, so he had to build this pit, and he did that, and he said, the, uh, the, he said at first he didn't get very many customers, but he said uh, there was this truckload of African-American GIs, and they drove past it and saw it and stopped and got out and went in, and next thing you know, they're spreading the word to U.S. soldiers all over mm -hmm. Europe, and then all these famous actors, they, Warren Beatty liked this place, and only they would come to us, it was this place for actors and actresses, famous people, and that happened. That happened quite a bit back in, back in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else? Um, let's see. Well, you know, I, I did not bring this gentleman's name with me, but I just found out this, this recent Paducah connection. You, you know the I iconic picture of uh, Martin Luther King's widow holding her daughter, her children, mm -hmm. at the funeral? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That gentleman lived in Paducah for a while that took the picture. Wow. I, I was rushing and didn't grab the book, uh, but his dad worked at, what, at West Kentucky, um, and he, I think he was the bookkeeper. Huh. And so uh, he moved in the late 50s. This gentleman went on to college, K-State, and became a renowned photo journalist. And uh, man, I'm so upset that I didn't get his name. But another Paducah connection that mm -hmm. has, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, far-reaching uh, implications sure. to to the world sure. and, and we don't know it and sure. something else I found out over the years is that um, who do you know to be the first African American female African American millionaires? Oprah Winfrey. Well before even Oprah there was uh, most people went Madam C.J. Walker. Was, well yes of yeah. course right mm -hmm. right of course right well right. that's not true it was Annie Turbo Malone. Yeah. She had ties to Baduca, came here in 1936, I believe. Wow. With a, gr a brown condor. And uh, I can't say that she stayed at, Padu uh, at the hotel, but her parents lived here in Paducah. She went on to be uh, the person to uh, patent the press and comb. And that may not mean anything to you, but all of us, Black females who had to sit up on Saturday morning get that hot comb ran <laughs> through. We all know what that means. Yeah. But uh, Madam um, Annie uh, Malone was her her beginnings came from Paducah. Wow. Her, That's her parents are buried here in Paducah. That's amazing. Uh, well, in the time we have left, let's talk about the hotel itself. When is it open? It's open by appointments unless we're having a program. And we try to have something at least once a month. The first Friday of the month is usually fish fry. We have a fish fry. Mm -hmm. And that helps us to, you know, keep our doors open, get people in to come in to see uh, what kind of exhibits we have. Um, and right now we do have a new exhibit with the um, Tuskegee Airmen uh, upstairs that we One have. of whom was from Paducah, Harold Alston, wasn't That's he? A right. ground crewman? Mm hmm Right, right. Uh, how communication old is, person. How old is he now? I believe he's in his 90s. He would have to be, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. wow. And of course, in the 8th of August celebration, the, the hotel is, is kind of a center of, of, uh, of activities yes, as well. Yes, yes, uh, we have folks to come by and, um, and it's really been fun over the last couple of years because people knew what the hotel looked like and, and we tried to keep it open even though, you know, there wasn't floors. You know, people could see how, you know, last year they didn't have this, but now they mm -hmm. got that. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so it's, it's been fun to have folks to come in and we're hoping to generate funds to uh, help with our building out back. but. More so recently, uh, we were talking about that we felt there was a need for a historical marker for the black community. Um, you know, um, it's, the community is really changing. A lot of the um, architectural structures that was like, that said that this was Paducah's African-American business community, they're gone now. Mm -hmm. 
Very few, and you well, know, in the area around the metropolitan, there were businesses, weren't barber shops and stores and mm -hmm. things, restaurants, uh, taverns, uh, um, gas stations. You know, because you weren't allowed to right. go downtown, try on clothes. Now, when I did some research on the eighth of August, I collected uh, newspaper clippings about the eighth of August, and what I did notice during August eighth. Uh, leading up to that time, the uh, merchants were advocating for black trade. They wanted, you know, they were saying you want to look good for the August 8th events. Really? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Really? And, and it was kind of funny. You would see something like that where, you know, you felt inviting, and then on the next page it might say, well, the darkies will have a good day, oh, <laughs> good no. time this day. Yeah. I'm like, what yeah. happened oh, there? It was just... It was just terribly racist that, mm -hmm. uh, 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 yeah, during that period, uh, it, it, it was, it was. Uh, well, in, in the hotel, uh, let us walk, I've been through it, of course, thoroughly enjoyed it, but as you go in the front door, w w it's, it's sort of like a little tour and you've got exhibits, so what do you see when you go through that When way? you first come in, you'll see um, the beautiful uh, lattice Wooding, woodwork that's uh, there at the hotel and uh, that divides the uh, reception area to the living quarters of the people who stayed there. Mm -hmm. And then you'll also get to see um, pictures of the previous owners, which is Coach Gaines. Uh, we wouldn't have the hotel if it wasn't for him. And his mom and pa, uh, father, uh, Olivia and Lester Gaines. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have pictures of some of the other owners, but mm -hmm. and then you go through uh, into another room. We had quilts. I don't know. We had the quilts up mm -hmm. when you came. Mm -hmm. We don't have them right now, but uh, you move through the dining room area and there's photographs, artwork of local African-American artists that is on display. And we also have uh, pictures of the first graduating group of Lincoln High School. And w below that picture, we have the paper bag test. Do you know about the paper bag test? Well, the paper bag test was to use to see if your, if your complexion was um, that of a paper bag or lighter, then you was uh, thought to be um, educatable. You know, you could learn. If you were darker than that, then you would not be able to go to school. My so God. I have the picture of the paper bag up under the picture of the Lincoln High School graduating class so people can reference and look and see, you know, that that wasn't just a myth. That was a standard uh, for learning. God, that's horrible. Mm -hmm. But you need things like that to show mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. You really do. Uh, wow. Uh, how many of the furnishings uh, do, uh, that are there that were original to the hotel? Um, well, in the bedroom, lots of it. <laughs> All throughout the hotel, uh, we have uh, original pieces of Well, when furniture. you started the restoration, w was there any furniture in it at the time? Mm -hmm. Oh, there was. Yeah, it was a lot of furniture and uh, furnishings. and. Uh, you know, people didn't, they were of that ear where folks didn't throw anything away. So uh, the back buildings were just chugged with wow, all of this old great. furniture yeah. and furniture that was within the hotel. Mm -hmm. So we cleaned it all up and mm -hmm. kept it. And then we had one room that was donated by the Anderson family. And uh, it's just simply beautiful. The, uh, they brought the quilts and they outfitted the whole room. It has a rocking chair, and mm -hmm. that's about the only room that's not original. And mm -hmm. then we had people to call. There was a lady um, that called and said, hey, I got a piece of furniture that belongs to the hotel. Come and get it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we mm -hmm. get things like that mm -hmm. as well. I guess you never f found the registration book. That would be marvelous. Yes. I mean, what an autograph collection that would be. Yeah. It was, I remember the last time we talked, it never had turned up, and it, and it probably won't. No. Uh, you know, one of the things, it, it's typical of an old hotel, and that the toilet and the, sh and the bathtub are down the hall. And I think today when we travel, we used to, uh, even a cheap motel has a toilet and shower in the room. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, a lot of hotels, it was down the hall. Mm -hmm. You shared the bathroom mm -hmm. with everybody on your floor. Uh, 
they also I'm sure they had meals. Did they cook meals for the for the for the for the mm -hmm. guests? Three mm -hmm. meals a day. Well, um, uh, Mr. Hang said it didn't matter what your night was be before that the lady would get you up, <laughs> have you come downstairs and get two biscuits and a cup of coffee. And so I guess that was your breakfast. Yeah, and he continental didn't say, breakfast, uh -huh. sort of, right. He didn't say anything about anything else that you got to eat, but he would yeah. always, yeah. you know, that, that morning, I guess it was rough for him. And <laughs> well, yeah, of course, you think two musicians, they would play late. You Typically mm -hmm. musicians play till two or three o'clock in the morning, and, and they would, I would think they'd sleep in if they would let them. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, how about the future in the two minutes we have left? What do you see as the future of the Metropolitan? What do you hope to do? Well, hope to keep it open, you know, number one. And uh, we're going to be developing more programs that are um, kid friendly. We're doing quilts now uh, with a group of kids and uh, hopefully we'll have that to share and then we always uh, uh, have uh, music events and we want to everything that the hotel was kind of about you know mm -hmm. the history will you know everything we want to do or that we do we want to teach some kind of history mm -hmm. and uh, we want to keep folks informed and uh, about the accomplishments but you mm -hmm. keep learning all the time it's just a never oh it is it is ending um, battle mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. You know, we just want to give the programs that, that will get people in, um, do our part for tourism, and... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the few seconds we have left, is there a contact phone number if somebody wanted to know more about the Metropolitan? Could they call you at a... Mm -hmm. And your number is? 270-443-7918. And you have an email address? Mm -hmm. Dobbs, D-O-B-S, at bellsouth.net. Very good. Enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. I, I went by being here. fast like it always does. Always good to have you on, and we'll have you on again one of these days. Okay, be happy to come. Very good. My guest today was Betty Dobson of the Hotel Metropolitan. I'm Barry Craig. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.